God, there isn't anything more important that you want to do right now than to connect with people you so dearly love. And I pray that you would do that for those watching online, wherever they're watching from, and for those that are gathered here. Would you connect with each of us, Jesus, that we would see you and that no one would miss the grace of God today. Lord, I pray it in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we are wrapping up the series today, this has been a great journey uh, for me. I hope it has been for you, for those of you who have been with us. And maybe just quickly to catch you up, as we've talked about Connected 3D, this is not a series about how evil technology is. Technology is technology. It's amoral. There's nothing intrinsically good or bad about it. It's what we do with it. And what we wanted to do with the series is to sort of help people just think through that. And so last week, uh, Pastor Tim talked about the importance of connecting with one another and and sometimes we need to just put the phone down and put technology down so we can see what is right there in front of us and not miss what's going on right there and talked a couple of weeks ago about God's heart and desire to connect with you and so often it's technology that can get in the way because it's so easy to get that dopamine hit when you grab a phone and is anybody texting me or what's going on and let me get on social media and it's so easy to do that and miss out on a connection with God. And so we did this not to make anybody feel guilty, but we used this phrase is to disconnect to connect. Because we wanted to encourage people like every once in a while, just intentionally disengage from technology for a little while and connect with God and connect with others. And today what we want to talk about is to disconnect to connect uh, in order to use you to connect other people to God. Now, what I've been amazed with over the last several weeks, and this has been true for people online that I've met when I'm not preaching and I'm on social media connecting with people, and certainly been true of people who have gathered here, I am amazed at how many people God is bringing here, and it's not because anybody invited them. There's just something that has been stirring in hearts of people that just have gathered here. And I can't remember the last week that has gone by where I haven't met a new person. And the only connection they have to St. John is I just sort of felt God was calling me back to him and back to a church. And so it's really neat to hear these stories from people. Just last week, met a, a family, and he hasn't been to church since he was seven, and none of them have, and yet they just felt compelled. And so we're coming, and they were here again today. What a wonderful gift of God that that is. And, and week after week, there's story after story of that, people connecting with that, that I think this is another season where God is just moving people, and people sense that they're disconnected from God, and boy, I need something. Going through this COVID-19, I need something something more solid in my life than what I've been building my life upon. And so we've encouraged people to disconnect in order to connect. And if you are a member here, if we have your mailing address, you received a red envelope like this, at least I hope you did. If you didn't, I don't know if there are any more, but we've got this and a whole bunch of other free material at our Connected Home Center, which is right outside the doors to the left. And if you're watching online, we'll be happy to mail you one of these. All you have to do is text us your address to that 833-440-0137, which is now in your address book. So you can just do that. Go to St. John and just send us your address and we'll be happy to send you a packet because there's a lot of cool things in this packet. And we hope this series lives longer than the three weeks we're preaching about it. We hope this continues to permeate everything we do. And there's a couple things in here I'll just invite you to if you haven't seen these in your packet. One is a screensaver and I love what it says. It says, how about connecting with someone that has a pulse? And you can pick up your phone and have that as your screensaver and go, oh, yeah, that's maybe a good idea. Maybe I need to disconnect for a moment and, and connect that way. We also in there have idea cards, and they're for every stage of life, so not every idea card you'll be able to connect with, um, but there's ones with small kids, older kids, kids out of the house, just, you know, I'm on my own, what do I do? All kinds of great idea cards of how to disconnect in order to connect and so we encourage you to grab a hold of that and do that. But what I want to do here this morning is ask a question that toddlers have been asking around the world ever since the beginning of time. And the question is simply this, well, why? Well, the reason why is because there's a God who created you and loves you and wants to connect with you. That is why. Why? Well, God created us to be in relationship with one another, and so we want you to engage and connect with other people as well, and so that's important. Well, why? 
Well, because God is changing hearts and lives of people, and God can do it himself. He's done that. I've seen it. God just transforms people and draws them to himself and just sort of plops people into your lap that you did nothing to invite them or make them feel welcome. They just showed up at your front doorstep. I would rather be a part of what God is doing in the hearts of people and be one of those people that come alongside at just the right moment, like Steve was saying that connects with somebody so that I can help them connect with God and help them connect with others. So again, we don't want you to make you feel guilty. What I really want to do this morning is unpack for you the heart of God because God is such a loving, compassionate God full of mercy and grace. I want you to see him today. I don't want to unpack for you what John read just a moment ago for you from Luke chapter 15. So if you've got a Bible with you and you like the old-fashioned thing like I do, I like having the print in front of me, uh, open up your Bible to Luke 15. If you've got the YouVersion Bible app, it's got all the answers already there. It's a great little app. You can go to the live feed and you can find uh, St. John there and click on this link. It'll have that. You can take notes on there and then they're digital. You have them forever. If you picked up one of the little worship folders on your way in, there's the outline. It's got Luke 15 there. We'll project it as well. All kinds of ways to engage in God's word. And I love Luke, just to give you a little, um, and props to to Luke. Um, He was a man who went to great detail to write about the life of Jesus. And then he wrote another book we call Acts, and that is really the early church. And just incredible detail. So listen to some of this detail in Luke chapter 15. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, just there, there's a lot there to unpack, and I won't take too much time diving into this, but I love the fact that tax collectors and sinners don't fall into the same category, that tax collectors are so abhorred and so hated in their society that they weren't even lumped in with sinners. Like, that's a whole story in itself. But what I love is what happened, that all these people that have been shunned by the religious society and the religious elite, that weren't allowed, they heard all the condemnation remarks for so long that these are the people, and what are they doing? They all were gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, that would be amazing if you knew the culture in that day because none of these people were welcomed to be a part of any congregation or any church. They weren't welcome to go into the temple and be there. They were looked down upon. They were the lowest of the low in society. And the fact that all of these people were flocking, and it wasn't just a couple of people. It says all of these people people were gathering around to hear Jesus. And I I wonder how that conversation went. If somebody's like, you've you've got to hear this Jesus guy. Oh, wait, another religious guy? No, I've heard enough from religious people. I've heard how bad I am, how evil I am, how I don't belong in society, how they wish I would just go away. I don't need. No, you've got, this guy's different. You've got to come around him. And they all gather around. And now look at verse two, but, of course, there's got to be a but, because then it's not really a story if there's not a but, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, these were the religious elite of the society of the day, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. Are there any mutters in the group watching at home, any mutters? <laughs> My wife accuses me of muttering every once in a while. It's sort of funny uh, because when, you know, working from home like everybody else uh, was for a long season, uh, my wife would say, man, your voice is way too loud. Can you go outside when you're on the phone? Because I can't even concentrate. I can't have a phone conversation when you're, because your voice is booming through the whole house. I'm like, well, I evidently, I either mutter or my voice is way too loud. I haven't figured out that nice little sweet spot that is a perfect voice uh, inside the house to speak at. But there's that. And so I thought about this muttering thing. I'm like, well, when, when do I mutter? And I thought, well, typically you mutter if you ever caught yourself muttering, or if you do it, there's probably one of two reasons you mutter. Number one is, is you don't want anybody else to really hear you. <laughs> That's a good way when you're sort of talking under your breath. You don't really want anybody to hear what you're saying, but you're going to say it anyway because you feel like you need to say it. And so that's why we mutter. Or another reason you might mutter is because you're not really confident in what you're saying. I'm not really sure this is right, so I don't really want to come out and say it. Because if the Pharisees and teachers of the law really felt this way, Like, look at this Jesus guy over here. He's eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. (laughs) But they're muttering. And so I wonder if there wasn't a little piece inside of them. Maybe just that little flicker of God's presence in their life. Going, I'm not sure we're living our life the right way. Or maybe it was part of it, like, why are all these people that we've cast aside in our society, why are they all gathering around Jesus? Why don't they all gather around us? Why don't we eat? with the sinners and tax collectors. 
What kind of system have we set up where nobody feels welcome here anymore? This is a, a sign, I think, of healthy people. What healthy people can do is look internally in themselves. Because it was really easy in this society, and it's really easy in our society to point a finger at somebody else and, and do this and point out everybody's flaws and look at what they're doing, look what they're doing, look what they're doing over there, look what they're doing. Anybody have a mom like this growing up? My mom used to tell me that. When you point out something in somebody else, there's three fingers pointing right back at you. Oh, wow, you're right. <laughs> Look at that. I'll never forget that, but I think that's a sign of a healthy, growing relationship with God is when you can be introspective. And so what's going on in your life that's causing you to mutter a little bit? And maybe I'm not really certain about this. Maybe there's something inside of me that needs to change. And so Jesus does what he always does. He tells a story, masterful storytelling. And he starts with this story. Jesus told him this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, which right off the bat, you've got a, like the religious society and the religious elite, like nobody shepherds people. That's the worst job of the worst. Like none of us, we've gotten way past that. We can't connect with shepherds. And I think Jesus told this story very intently. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go? after that lost sheep until he finds it and when he finds it doesn't he joyfully put it on his shoulders and then goes home and then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says rejoice with me for i have found the lost sheep i tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent the first thing i, I want to know is i, I want to meet these 99 people that don't need to repent <laughs> Who is it that can't find a single thing that they've done wrong in their life that they need to repent of and change of? Man, that's certainly not true of me. I don't count myself as one of those 99 who doesn't need to repent because I know I'm not done yet. God is not done working on me. There are things that God has still needs to change in my heart and he is still working at me. I am a work in progress and you are a work in progress. And this is where I think Jesus is being ironic or maybe a little bit sarcastic. Like all you people who think you're so much better than everybody else, and you look down on everybody else, you think that somehow you're pleasing God because you live in such a holy, righteous kind of way. But what I think is even more important than this is the heartbeat of God behind this. Because what does heaven do? Heaven rejoices not over all of you who are saved and all of you who are doing your good things and good deeds and you look better than everybody else. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. This gets at the heart of God. God's joy comes from watching one sinner turn. And so if you don't like that story, Jesus has another story. And he goes on. Or, you don't like that one? I got another one for you. Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. You see a common theme here in these stories? Lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God. Lost people have always mattered to God. I once was lost. God found me. If you're a follower of Jesus, that is your story as well. You were once lost and you were found. Why? Because God loves lost people. If you're watching today and you're like, I don't really know Jesus. I'm not a follower of his. Or you're here today and I don't really know about this Jesus thing at all. Just know God's heart for you is God loves lost people. God loves people that have wandered away from him or have never known who he is. God loves you. God loves lost people. And this isn't just a new Jesus thing. This has been God's heart from the very beginning. And if you want to turn back in Isaiah, um, this great prophet in the Old Testament, I love this picture he has of God. Look at verse 11 in chapter 40. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And that is the heartbeat of our God, that God loves 
lost people. They matter to him. Some of you might have seen our tagline that we use. It's on our website, and we've said it several times. It's, you matter to God, and you matter to us. Because that's really what we want the world to know. That is the message that we want to go from this place. And every encounter that they have with us or any of us, we want them to know you matter to God, regardless of your past, regardless of your background, regardless of anything about your life. You matter to God and you matter to us. And we try to demonstrate that in, in new kind of ways. And right before COVID hit, I had shared with you, we just put together a concierge team. And on our new website that we had launched, we had a button on there. It was called Plan a Visit. So anybody who was new with us here and wanted to just intently plan to come and visit us. And so we've got all kinds of information about what to expect. But if you plan a visit and you give us contact information, we have a concierge team that will get back with you within hours, depending on when you, um, when you fill out that plan a visit form. And so this concierge team calls people up and says, hey, I see you're planning a visit and I want to make it the best visit possible. What questions can I answer for you? What do you want to know? Well, what should I wear? You know, what do you wear? How long am I going to be there? Do you have coffee? Is there something to eat there? Am I, you know, welcome? Are our kids welcome here? Do you have things for kids going on? Where do I park? What, anything they'd ever want to know. And, and one of the last things they'll share with them is, oh, by the way, um, if you're coming this Sunday. We're going to have a parking spot reserved for you out front. And some of you have seen those signs that are parked right outside in front of the fountain. It says reserve parking. <laughs> Unless your name's written on it, please don't park there. <laughs> That's not for you. And it's not because we don't love you. We love you. But that is for people that are just connecting with us for the very first time because we want to go over the top and communicate to everyone that you matter to God and you matter to us enough where we're going to reserve a spot for you and we're going to be ready for you when you come here. We're expecting you to be here. Man, I love this concierge team. See, the truth of the matter is, as well, is that heaven rejoices with just taking one little step toward Jesus. Just one step in the right direction, all of heaven rejoices. And I want to share with you, much to um, my embarrassment, when I was early in my ministry and people would join the church, what brought me great joy uh, was when they joined because when they joined, it's like, oh, that's one more person that's there. And I found myself, fortunately, after a while where God was just working on my heart, is like, really, that's what you're rejoicing over? The fact that you can add one more person to your roles, that now you're one more person more important than another pastor because you got one more person more than somebody else? And I saw that for what it was, how evil that was. And God, I don't want that to be my story. I don't want that to be what my heart rejoices over is one more person coming or one more person giving or one more person serving. Man, I want to rejoice at every step along the way when everybody and anybody makes just one step in the right direction, regardless of how broken they are, that they make one step in the right direction. And maybe that first step is, I don't really know about this Jesus at all, but I think I'm going to come back next week. That all of heaven just rejoices in that. Even if they go to another church, that I want my soul to go, man, praise God. That is a step in the right direction. I'm going to join with heaven right now that you found a connection and God grabbed a hold of your heart. Even if you want to go somewhere else, I don't really care. I want my heart to rejoice in that. I want my heart to rejoice. I don't even know, God, if you're there or if you exist. But boy, tonight when I lay down my head, I want to cry out to you and I'm going to try this thing called prayer and I'm going to just see if you're listening. I want to be right along their side cheering them on, going, man, I rejoice with angels in heaven right now that are rejoicing because that one step in the right direction that you are taking, that is the heartbeat of God. So what makes you rejoice? Do you rejoice when people start giving, when people start serving, when people start behaving the right way? Does that make you rejoice? Or do you just rejoice when somebody makes one little step in the right direction toward Jesus? Can we just make a commitment today? I really hope this is true of all of us. Can we just be grace kind of people? <laughs> Knowing that we all need the grace of God, can we just be grace people? That instead of demanding people behave a certain way, let's just be grace people and just be patient and allow God to do his work that he does in every single one of us. 
because I need God's amazing grace. You need God's amazing grace. We all need God's amazing grace. And so let's not look down on somebody because they don't know when they're supposed to stand and when they're supposed to sit. They don't know how to sing a song. They don't know who Jesus is. They never heard the Trinity before. They have never heard of Luke before. Let's just rejoice in the fact that they are here today and be grace people. It's okay if you don't know anything. It's okay that you don't have a relationship. You don't have a single Bible passage committed to memory. It's okay. We love you. We're grace kind of people here. And boy, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, this is sort of where the message ends and with just this challenge. Go find a grace community. One that you can experience God's amazing grace that has a heartbeat like this that just loves lost people who are hurting. But if you are a follower of Jesus today, there's one more step I want to give to you today. Because part of me, I, I feel bad that every... Um, you know, these, a lot of these new people that are coming, they haven't been invited by anybody. God is just bringing them. I'm like, God, why is it that you have to bring them? Why can't we invite them? <laughs> why can't we go out and find people and invite them and be a part of that process? And so here's my challenge to you is each one, because you're one. <laughs> if you're a follower of Jesus, you are one of those. Because that's all of our story, that we didn't go chasing after God. God came chasing after us. And God awakened our soul once we were lost and now we are found. And that is our story. So each one would go out and reach one. And I hope this is our prayer today. That before you walk out the doors that you maybe just silently say it to yourself or with your family or friends or whoever you're with today. God, would you help me? I'm one of yours. Let me be one of those each one to reach one. Would you lead me to somebody today, Jesus, that just might need your touch? A couple Sundays ago, I was out in the yard after church and playing uh, fetch with my dog. He loves to chase tennis balls around, so I'm throwing them as far as I can, and he chases them and picks them up. And while I was doing that in our front yard, here comes the Amazon truck, because we're one of those families that gets a whole bunch of boxes from Amazon. And so they pulled up, and, and because a car pulls up in the driveway, my dog Sammy instantly assumes that they're here for him. And so he runs to the car and puts his paws, you know, tries to jump up on the thing. So I go over there and grab him and get him down. I'm like, he's really harmless, and she's rolling down her window, like afraid to get out of the car. I'm like, he's really harmless. I mean, he's a golden retriever. He's not really intimidating, but he's, I know he's a big dog, but thank you. And so she gets a package, and she hands it through the window, and, and some I don't know what it was. I just, like a spirit of God just compelled me. And I said, you know what? Thank you so much for delivering on Sunday and for working on Sunday. I know you probably never see anybody because you just drop packages on the front porch and you leave and you never see anybody. But I just want to be one of those that said, thank you for delivering a package to me on Sunday. She said, well, thank you. I said, just God bless you as you go about your work today and just know that somebody appreciates you and, and God loves you. And, and that was it. She goes, okay, thank you very much. And I got to go. And she had a smile on her face and she pulled out of the driveway and, and went away. I don't know what God has in store for you this week. Uh, maybe it's an appliance that's going to go out this week and you got to call somebody to come and fix your appliance. I have a feeling that more than just fixing an appliance, God has another reason for that person being there at your house. God does those kind of things, especially when we ask him to. God, would you use me so each one can reach one? I, I want us to be part uh, of that kind of community of people that are grace people, that love people, that, that partner with God because God is doing an extraordinary work. And I think that's one of the things in COVID-19 that God is doing around the world, that God is beginning to awaken souls again like he did in the age of Jesus where, where lost people are being found, people who are trapped in darkness, people who are lonely and isolated that they're coming to know who Jesus is. And we want to be a part of that because they matter to God and they matter to us.